live from our Coco Mlele studios. This is Joy News Prime with me, Samuel Kojo Brace. Tonight, global news giant Al Jazeera calls bluff of the presidency in 16. They will neither apologize nor retract the gold mafia documentary that the Jubilee House claims portrayed the president as a beneficiary of gold smuggling. We have details of an Al Jazeera response to a Joy News request. Now, radio show host with Dagbon Radio attacked while hosting live show by former NDC constituency deputy communication director will tell you more. Now, logged up investment holders forum calls on government to use part of $250 million World Bank Disability Fund to clear their logged up funds or face their wrath. Whatever we get from this financial stability fund, part of it should be used to pay every investor who has lock up funds in the financial sector then we can restore confidence also minerals commission ceo accuses the then interministerial committee on illegal mining led by professor frimpong boating of usurping the powers of his agency the reason why they face resistance from them more as a minority in parliament say they have kick-started processes to have a full-scale parliamentary probe into recent allegations contained in the professor frimpong boating galamsey report uh, at now, a fresh investors group, the Locked Up Investment Holders Forum, wants government to use part of $250 million World Bank Stability Fund to clear their locked up investment. The group says the refusal of government to pay contractors is largely responsible for the financial institution's inability to pay back their investment. There's more in the following report by James Kwesi Averji. So this fresh group is an amalgamation of customers of different financial investment institutions, some of which are pensioners as well as persons in active service. Others even come from people working in the informal sector who have got interest in investment and have uh, done their investment with these companies. Now, the problem is that these, all of these financial companies are still in, uh, uh, in operation. They are not part of those who government have revoked their licenses, and so they are still in service but unable to pay the interest as well as the capital of their investment. Convener of the group, Dr. Iduana Nienji, have summed up some of the reasons they have been given to them for which they have not been able to pay them which have been included in this petition that they have put together to send to the Bank of Ghana. Lack of patronage of their services arising from the loss of confidence in the banking and financial services sector following the banking cleaning cleanup exercise. Another reason is that the government inability to make payments against loans granted to government contractors against their interim payment certificates. We wish to believe that the Bank of Ghana appreciates the negative effect on public confidence in the Ghanaian. Whatever we get from this financial stability fund, part of it should be used to pay every investor who has locked up funds in the financial sector. Then we can restore confidence. Then we can rebuild our financial sector then the financial sector would provide the support for the development of the economy. We wish to advise that if we do not receive a positive response from you towards the resolution of our complaint, we shall explore other means of getting a resolution to our complaint. Meanwhile, some members or some customers of the NDK Financial Services as well as SIC uh, uh, Financial Investment Limited have been sharing their experience with us, what they have been going through in the past three to five years. All these three companies, SIC Financial Services, Bond Financial Services, Legacy Capital, when the cleanup came up, they decided to use the cleanup to stop paying interest on any investments. They say government, uh, government says they should hold on, they should put everything in a pot, and at the end of the year, the money which they make from their investment will be shared to all individuals who are in there. And for, you go to the office, no 
somebody says anything to you. It is born financial services where I want to do some takashi. That they pay me 10,000 as interest. Uh, it's supposed to be on weekly basis, but as and when they feel like they, they, they tell me that the money did not come, that's where they, they pay. But the whole idea is to be able to live a comfortable life after work. Um, so uh, I came on pension about two years ago, uh, still have kids in school. And so you want to be able to have enough money to pay their fees and, you know, etc. Take care of your health needs and theirs as well. And um, uh, now it's difficult. When was the last time you received any returns from your investment? It's about three years ago. From the Clocksack Auditorium here in Accra, my name is James Kwesi Aveji for Joy News. Now to other stories, we will not apologize. That is the response of global news giant Al Jazeera to the presidency. Jubilee House had written to Al Jazeera demanding an immediate retraction and apologies for the broadcast of the highly explosive gold mafia documentary that portrayed the president of Kufado as a beneficiary of an international gold smuggling syndicate. The four-part investigation by Al Jazeera's investigative unit reviewed a series of gold smuggling gangs in Africa who helped criminals launder hundreds of millions of dollars getting rich themselves while plundering their nations in a part of the documentary one alistair mafias claimed he smuggled up to 40 million dollars worth of gold through ghana every month and also claimed to know president kufado who he also claimed acted as his lawyer once now joy news editor and head of our political desk evans mainsa joins me in the studio with more on this but evans um uh, welcome but just before we proceed uh, let's listen to that part of the documentary that the president really had issues with mm. thias is a gold trader he designs money laundering schemes for african leaders next to swaziland the king is a close friend of mine the zambia president's close friend of my friend DRC Congo, the president has invited me several times there to come and build a refinery. So these can help people like us to get the money clean. Mr. Stanley leads the I-Unit undercover team. Reporters are posing as gangsters who need to launder $100 million in dirty cash from China. Ghana president is a good friend of mine. In fact, he was my lawyer. Like Cyril Ramaphosa here, I know him, I know his kids. Yeah. I'm Bobby Gigi. Ewan McMillan is a gold smuggler from Zimbabwe. They call him Mr. Gold. They refer to Zimbabwe's president, Manangagwa, by his initials, E.D. Zim, E.D. is my partner. I can't say it in public because he's sanctioned. I know ED as well. But they I don't know him three months ago, sitting with him, chatting to him. Manangagwa's protection proves you. Well, so uh, that's the part of the documentary that uh, really the presidency had issues with. Uh, Evans, what more are we learning? But just before we get to that, the presidency had written this letter to. Um, Al Jazeera demanding some retraction and apology. That, what were their main issues? So their main issues was this reference that was made to the president. Mm. So Alistair uh, alleges in this piece mm. that the president was his personal lawyer mm. and so that created a certain relationship with an alleged gold smuggler. So the presidency had written to Al Jazeera demanding two things. One, retract. Secondly, apologize. Mm -hmm. But then also they had made it clear to them. So we, had, we also learned from that letter they wrote that the Al Jazeera, before they went public with their documentary, had written to the presidency on the 6th of April. Uh, and the presidency had replied on the 11th, telling them that the presidency has no recollection of representing this Matthias individual. And also that the president had not been in private practice since 2000. And so that's a long period. And so they wrote back to them and made a few demands. So one, specify the period when Alistair, you claim Alistair was a, a client of the president. Mm -hmm. 
And then second, another allegation that was made in this uh, piece by Alistair was that he was a beneficiary of a contract in Ghana in the region of $100 million. Again, they wanted further and better particulars about that particular contract that was, that was claimed in this documentary to have been awarded to Alistair uh, as a result of his you know, close relationship with the president. Mm -hmm. Interesting. There were also some deadlines given to Al Jazeera to, to try to then respond to this letter, right? Mm, it was immediate. They wanted this done <clears throat> immediately. Mm. We know that Al Jazeera, from everything else we've, we've read, didn't comply with that directive. Mm. So today, uh, we wrote to Al Jazeera. Mm. Um, Al Jazeera was giving a, a firm, you know, word from the presidency, a demand, mm. in essence, that retract and apologize immediately. Right, and mm. with the with implied threats in there. I mean, mm. what then was suggested was that if Al Jazeera does not take this course of action in retracting and apologizing, then the presidency will exercise all of, all of his options. Mm. Right, mm. Um, and if to quote the presidency, it is imperative that you act forthwith in this request within seven days uh, from the date of receipt of this letter. Mm. And so seven days had elapsed. So we thought. We should check with Al Jazeera if they have replied to the presidency, and we checked, and they have. They have responded to to the presidency. They have responded to the presidency. So, so they didn't they didn't wait for the days to elapse before then the presidency could switch in the next leg. Yeah, I mean this but, is a, this is a global media giant, and so mm -hmm. you can you can imagine they had a whole team had, okay. that were prepared. They knew there could be legal implications. Mm -hmm. From this, what do we know really? Because if they, uh, I mean, they say they have responded. What about the retraction and apology bit? They, they were categorical in, our, in the response they gave us that they were not going to retract and they were not going to apologize. And your reason was simple, that they have, in their letter to the presidency, offered clarifications and corrected inaccuracy. So their position is that the president's uh, account of things was, in, was, was inaccurate. Mm. And so they've taken, an, they've taken the opportunity in responding to the presidency to correct some parts of the content and clarify various points mm. to call mm. them directly in the mail that they, that they fired back at us today when we were inquired. Mm. And then they went ahead to say, quote, since the documentary did not actually allege what the president's office has suggested, it did, we will not be apologizing or removing it from publication, mm. right? And it claims that their reply to the president's office was by way of confidential letter. Mm. So we've checked with the presidency. Yes, they have received this particular response from the Al Jazeera. But I'm told by you know, sources at the Jubilee House that their understanding of the Al Jazeera letter to them is not a categorical no, we apologize, someone will not retract. Mm. As to what it is, um, you know, it remains to be seen. But Al Jazeera is very clear mm. in their response to us. Mm. And, and this, by the way, it is their investigative wing. And that's the wing that did this particular uh, work that responded to okay. us, the Al Jazeera investigations, mm -hmm. and that they were categorical. Mm -hmm. We're waiting. I'm told the president is in, um, is in London, London, and this has come to his attention. So the president is a lawyer, mm -hmm. and his team of lawyers are there, so they have to consider the options. Okay. All right. Uh, grateful. Let's bring in uh, a legal practitioner here, uh, lawyer Samson Ayeni, to help us really appreciate the legal angles to this development. Uh, grateful to you for joining us. Now, Al Jazeera says that they are not going to retract, they are not going to apologize. According to the presidency, with the response that Al Jazeera brought, it doesn't really say that they are not going to apologize for this. What is the next leg, you know, that the presidency could take? The, the presidency, <clears throat> as an institution, does not have capacity, so to speak, generally, to take up a suit against anybody. Mm. The executive cannot say, praise, you have defamed the executive or you have defamed government, mm. so we will sue you. Law, the law does not allow that. So it must be an individual within the presidency that will take an action. And as we understand, this will be the president. Now, when you write 
to seek for a retraction, an apology, or a retraction, or an apology, mm -hmm. you are giving the media organization or the individual involved an opportunity to correct or avoid illegal action. Mm -hmm. So when they say that we are not retracting, we are not apologizing, it means that they have received legal advice, they have, had, they have looked at their, what they have, you are complaining about again, and their view is that we have not defamed you as you claim. Um, you say it is malicious, it is not. So we are not retracting, we are not apologizing. Do what you will. When they say that, the next step you can take is to go to court. So now the ball is squarely in the court of the president to determine that he will sue or he will not sue. Mm -hmm. If he will not sue, sometimes it is not wise to ask for a retraction and apology because when you don't get it, then you find yourself in trouble. Mm, interesting. Now, Al Jazeera is not within our jurisdiction. So how does the president then address the issue of jurisdiction in terms of they choosing the option of going on to press a legal charge against Al Jazeera? Right. The law is that in defamation or in the cyber or internet space, when comments are made about you and you find the comments offending or defamatory, it doesn't matter where the comments were made. Mm. What matters is where the comments were heard. So if you sat in Al Jazeera's headquarters in America and you made those comments and the comments were heard in Ghana, the president is entitled to take up a suit here in Ghana. Now, um, he could take up the suit anywhere in the world, but the most appropriate, from my examination, most appropriate place, place where he may take the suit will be in Ghana. He could actually go to where Al Jazeera's physical office is and take the suit. But he could take it in Ghana because uh, the law has, it has been established that where your reputation is most affected is where you, you may want to take the suit. The president is well known in Ghana. Mm. His reputation that he, he alleges has been defamed is better, you know, as it were, asserted in Ghana. But he could assert it anywhere else. Okay. But the Ghanaian people mm -hmm. are the people that are closest to him. So he can take a suit right here in Ghana. Okay. And there is precedent right here in Ghana. People have taken suits against persons and entities that don't live in Ghana or broadcast from Ghana. Okay. And they have won the suit. Okay. Mm. Uh, grateful to you, lawyer Samson Ayenini, for the education at uh, this night. Now, uh, what about how Ghana can repair its uh, international image as the presidency has already alleged that this documentary did some damage to the image of uh, the presidency? We're joined on the line by international relations expert with the University of Education, whenever Dr. Ismail Hlovo, he joins us via Zoom now. Doc. The key so, uh, grateful uh, for your time here. Uh, uh, now that the Al Jazeera is responding that they are not going to retract and they are not going to apologize, how does the president and in fact the presidency deal with repairing the, the image according to them has been damaged by that documentary? Uh, good evening and uh, good evening to your viewers. Uh, it is important that we understand that the documentary and the way we have proceeded about it have done some damage to the image of the state of Ghana. Yeah. So in trying to repair this image, we must find a way to communicate uh, the position as we think is the right position to the rest of the world and to the Ghanaian public. So to start with a public statement 
responding to the specific allegations contained in the documentary against the president is very important. Uh, you may also look for another global media giant and try to um, get your version of the story to the Ghanaian public and the international community. Uh, the other option may be to try to engage the states uh, that host Al Jazeera. Mm. But that option is quite dicey because of the need to protect uh, press freedom. In going so, we may seem to be going against the, the cherished value of press freedom. But that is also an option that is open to us. That is if we believe that it is a deliberate attempt to tarnish our image as the president is communicating, then we may want to engage the, the other state to find uh, uh, ways by which they can help us to, to get uh, Al Jazeera to, to, to retract and uh, apologize as, as it were. But mm. that is conditioned on the premise that we are sure that the, 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 the content of the documentary is a misrepresentation of the facts and uh, does not bear uh, to the true story of what happened. Mm. So mm. Uh, these options are open to us. And okay. it, 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 it then also leads to the bigger question of Africa and the global media. Uh, we need, as it were, an African media giant that sometimes will take up uh, the alternative view from, from the African side. If you've seen the international media terrain, it seems that this global media giant uh, have, over the years, put out stories, some of which were quite unfounded, and they get away with it because we do not have an alternative source of information on Africa. So we, we need, as it were, Africans' own global media that will okay. project the true values okay. of Africa and tell our story. All right. Uh, grateful to you, sir, for joining us here. Yeah, moving on to other stories. Radio show host with Dagbon Radio, Sadiq Abubkari Gariba, uh, was attacked while hosting a live show on his radio station. Former NDC constituency deputy communication director Hadi Pagaza stormed the studio and disrupted the program. Mr. Pagaza is captured by studio cameras or holding the broadcaster by the neck and attempting to drag him out. This happened on the day stakeholders in the communication space had raised red flags over the need to secure press freedom. Listen to British High Commissioner to Ghana, Harriet Thompson, raised similar concerns yesterday. Continuing to talk about those issues that are troubling, um, that are troubling journalists, uh, ensuring that the government really understands what it's like day to day for any journalist to get out and do their job, uh, the challenges that they face. I think that um, there is a risk, I'm a civil servant myself, there's a risk that civil servants sort of talk about things that we haven't experienced. So those, those relationships uh, between the different sides, the different actors in this space are absolutely crucial so that each understands the other's perspective and is able to move forward together. It's so important to have journalists who are bold and committed enough to keep going until they've uncovered the story, until they've really got to the bottom of what's going on. I would... Um, Urge them to do a proper thorough job. There's too much misinformation and disinformation out there at the moment. And really effective journalism needs to be alive to that. The UK is going to be offering some training in that space to journalists. We've done some, we'll do a bit more. Um, because there's a risk that well-respected um, journalists who are committed to that moral code, committed to ethical reporting, are being misled by some of that information that's out there at the moment. So it's about being alive to the risk, it's about being bold, being committed, and knowing who to turn to when something happens that, that makes you feel intimidated, makes you feel like you're being restricted from doing your job. Let's get the latest on this incident at Dabon Radio. Northern Regional Correspondent Martina Bugri joins us with more. M Martina, so from the morning till now, what has been the latest development on this particular matter? Martina, kindly unmute so we can hear what you're telling us. Like I was saying, um, the matter has been reported to the police, but we also know that um, Mr. Pagaza did not report to the police, even though he was invited. Um, my checks indicated that he didn't turn up. Now, what we, we are also learning is that normally when somebody reports uh, an issue mm. like assault, you, they call in the person being accused. And so there's the preliminary uh, speaking to the two of them. That has not been done because with my checks, uh, 
with Garba this evening. He hasn't been called back to the police. So, so that goes to confirm from my sources that uh, Mr. Pagaza did not report to the police. Uh, my sources within the police tell me that mm. uh, they have begun investigations and they are possibly, uh, they will possibly arrest him this night as we speak. That's what I understand. Grateful to you, Martin Abogrede. Now, two other stories. Scores of residents of Nima in the Ayawasu East Municipality of Greater Accra have taken to the street today to protest the poor state of their road, abandoned project, and the general neglect of their community by the government. Joy News' Prince Kwame Kudaga has been engaging some protesters in this report. Even though Nima and Mamobi routinely suffer from inadequate provisions of basic facilities such as housing, water, electricity and drainage systems, the communities continue to grow. The president's commitment to slam upgrading of Nima and Mamubi was stated forcefully in his message of the state of the nation eloquently and elegantly delivered in parliament on the 20th day of February 2019. The transformation of approximately 1,039 acres of prime land which Nima and Mamobi occupy will give meaning and beauty to the present vision of inner city and Zongo development. To this end, we are collaborating with the Ministries of Lands and Natural Resources, inner city and Zongo development to make the aforesaid area a world-class residential enclave close to Jubilee House, the seat of government, and I want to stress this, for the benefit of those who enjoy propaganda without dislodging the good people who currently dwell in Nima and Mamobi. This is Samuel Atachnya, former Minister for Works and Housing, speaking in May of 2019. The line, residents of this community where the president's private residence is located, are unhappy about the state of development in the community. <laughs> you can think of in the country is here with us this is a place where the president himself sleeps the vice president lives in kanda this is the same constituency that houses the jubilee house the, the nadmo headquarters the only serving military uh, uh, hospital in ghana the nation's broadcaster so these are the facilities that we are surrounded with in the constituency and yes the, the bad dose that we have nima is the mother of all the Ayawasos. Ayawasu started from Nima. And then we have now Ayawasu Central. Now we have Ayawasu West Wagon. We have Ayawasu North. And I can tell you all these Ayawasos have been asphalted, except Nima. The promised redevelopment project has not started. Roads have developed portals and a few projects there have also been abandoned. Residents hit the streets this morning holding placards and chanting slogans demanding action from government. They expressed frustration at living in a community with inadequate healthcare facilities, lack of basic amenities, and poor infrastructure. You see us on the road because too much. Look, this is uh, 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 as to tell for us to. You can see if I don't know whether if they, they are doing a, a, a galamse here. I don't know because look at the holes. Water is coming in. So, I don't know. You, you saw it. I think so. You saw it. So, Nima, they neglect us. That is why you see us on the road. That we need to voice. We need to tell our people. We need to tell the president. The vice president. Who said he's a, he's a Zongo man. And even he sleep in Zongo. He always, the car, his car always move on the Nima road, Nima highway. What are they doing to Nima? So we need Nima to change. There's more of uh, stories coming up after the break. Stay with us.
And welcome back from the break. Resident of Adana want Electrochem Ghana Limited to stop mining salt in the Songo Basin. According to the aggrieved locals, government must abrogate its contract with the owner of the firm, Daniel Macaulay, since the extraction of salt in the area is having a toll on them. Welding, welding placards in red and black regalias. The furious indigents marched from the Obra Sport to Blackstar Square, where they presented a petition on their grievances. Listen to some of the residents from Madan who participated in the protest earlier this afternoon. About atrocities which are being committed against us on our own land by agents of Daniel McCauley, popularly known as McDan, and the security agencies, and to particularly carry a message to him that he has no legitimate right to abuse us on our own land. We shall fearlessly and forcibly fight for our rights as guaranteed the nation's constitution by all legitimate means at, all, at our disposal. We would like you, ladies and gentlemen of the press, to carry our message to the nation and to the world that gross human rights abuse are being perpetrated at Adan Songo Lagoon by Daniel McCauley and the security forces on our own land with the sole intention of grabbing our land and resources for the sole benefit of Magdan and his cronies in this government. No, we, we are not going to agree with the government that what we brought to him if he will not look at it. Because what we are saying is a serious matter. It's life and bread matter. And I don't think this is going to make his mind that he will not do anything about whatever we, are, we came to present to him. Because before somebody will move from far away Ada to Accra to walk through the principal street of Accra into Independence Square to put the, the grievance before the president. He has to do something about it because it's a serious matter. It's a serious matter. We are saying that the list that they gave to Magdan, it will never help us. It is, it is not going to help us in any way. Therefore, Parliament and then the Speaker, the President, they should look at it again. Now, receiving the petition on behalf of the president, the deputy chief of staff, Emmanuel Edumwa Bosman, says government will take the needed steps to address the grievances. Thank you for having a very peaceful procession throughout the streets of Accra. Um, it shows that despite the fact that you are agitated, you are also mindful of not trampling on the rights of other people. Um, I can assure you on behalf of the president for whom I've received this petition, that it should be looked into. Um, we should always bear in mind that His Excellency the President swore an oath to the people of Ghana and to defend the Constitution. In as much as you have certain grievances, we should also recognize that the President is by dint of the oath he has sworn bound to protect the interest of natural persons like yourselves and legal persons like companies. So we will look into it and see where the merits are and what needs to be done. And as much as possible, the president will react to it accordingly. Thank you very much, and God bless us all. Uh, joining us by phone is the Secretary to the Parliament Chief of Adan, Jonathan Dokochu, uh, with more on this particular development. Grateful for joining us, sir. Now, why is the Ada Songo always an issue in the media? Why isn't the traditional authority able to take control of this? Thank you very much. Uh, before I will say anything, uh, regarding to the demonstration today, the Parma chief and the traditional authority will, report, will respond soon to the demonstration. Mm. Uh, secondly, uh, the traditional council and the Parma chief are not aware of this demonstration. Okay. Neither they were informed of this demonstration, but it was organized by a group of Garamitiers who produce salt, Garamitiers in salt. They organize it, and that uh, the, the cause of alarm, uh, it is they who need to request authority so that they can speak with uh, leadership and leadership can discuss and, you know, advise as to how it should go. Mm -hmm. Yes, 
Uh, but but how, how are you able to, to tell that these are galamsayers and not people of your area who have genuine concerns about yeah, what's going on? Because uh, there are people who do uh, galamsay activities that are called atiatu. And uh, when the whole thing was given to uh, the investor to redevelop, there was this understanding that the developer of the investor will create a community plan for every community community around the Songo Lagoon, mm. so that if it should in case anybody does not get uh, a permanent opportunity with the company, you can have your own access with the community plan. Mm. And because of they have seen this thing, they who are operating that type of galaxy are trying to prevent this noble idea. And that's why I call them galaxies. Okay, I'm, I'm grateful to you. Uh, we'll, we'll keep tabs on this particular development and we'll update you in subsequent okay. bulletins. But for now, peoples and teachers of Hiawa Methodist Basic School in the Wasa Aminfi Central District of the Western Region are calling on government and other benevolent organizations to come to the aid of the school by building proper classroom blocks for them. School authorities say the poor infrastructure in the school is affecting smooth academic work, leading to poor performance. Poor infrastructure in some basic schools has been identified as a major driver of school dropout in the country. The Hiawa Methodist Basic School is suffering from the same fate and they want something to be done urgently. Join us to our cameras there and this is what we captured. It's raining. We suffer. So when it starts raining, the teachers let us close and go home. The school building is not good for us. We are suffering. Marian Kobna. A people here telling me about the sort of challenges they have in this school. Hiawa Methodist Basic is one of only two basic schools in Hiawa, a mining community in the Amenfi Central District of the Western Region. Kids here are not as fortunate as their counterparts in urban centers. We want the government to help us with our school. It's um, the building to, we want them to build another school for us. We are suffering, especially the building, the um, board, chalk. We don't have a proper place to learn. Sometimes some snakes come from the forest. Everybody starts running. We are scared. We, we need help. It disturbs us, the forest and the school. We need another school and they need to help us. The wooden structures here, which serves as classrooms for these children, have cracks on them from windows, chairs, doors, and even the roof. Everything here seems to be falling apart piece by piece. School children clamor together on single desk because of lack of furniture here we are told that when it rains water come gushing through the classrooms marian says aside the poor school infrastructure the pupils in this school have just few test books we need books we don't have books reading books um english math history science creative all the um, um, subjects we learn. We don't have books, especially, especially the teachers use their computers and their phones to teach us. We don't have books, so we need books. Confidence Awuvi is a school teacher. According to her, the nature of the school building compels them to close school anytime it rains. When it's rain, we have to close down the school and go home. And all these are challenges which will not help them improve their academic performance. Because here is a region that mostly it's rain. So when it's rain every time and we have to close down the school, it's going to affect the kids. And at the end of the term, we don't achieve anything. And all these are discomforting to us. I've been here for a year now, but my other, how my other colleagues explain, it has been going on for a very long time. And that's the only thing they do when it's about to rain. They have to close down the school because sometimes it's, the wind blows very heavily. And looking at how the classroom is, it's not good for the kids. Something might hit them because it's an open place. Yeah. Madam Confidence says the situation 
has a telling impact on the kids. I'm a class teacher, so when I come to school and I teach something, and maybe you give them a test, you don't see that reflecting them. So you'll be like, I have thought this, so what's happened? Yeah, and all these are uh, challenges, and I see that because of all these distractions, because you'll be teaching, and something will come up, you have to go home. So it doesn't, they don't get anything at the end of the day. So you have to be repeating one thing. So if I'm to, to teach a topic, uh, five topics for a term, and I do only two, it will affect them. But they are doing the same curriculum with someone who is in a comfortable or conducive environment. One of the challenges confronting pupils and teachers here is the lack of a sanitary facility that compels both pupils and teachers to resort to the bushes to attend to nature's call. For my health condition, they passing stool in their bush, sitting here, it's discomforting to the kids as well. Because we don't have a urinal and a toilet, so they do all that in the bush. And sitting here for eight hours, it's, it's really disturbing. The school management committee chairman of the Hiawa Methodist Business School, Ousu Kwedu, explains these challenges are seriously affecting the education of the peoples here. He says without some quick intervention from the government, these children will continue to learn under such terrible conditions. How did we be through the last thing I always say is you try to pass, I got the film tea. And then we also club by us a mute here. Heating so to me, Bemma, Colano, a motor. The hundred dozen, every environment in a class were a car Because environment is not determined by life. The environment is not a one Colano. If it's environment in a cry, young population, a bad dozen. But then, you know, I will only be be who I now say. I would like the government to come to our aid and help us. At least when we get a conducive place, it will be better. We are not asking for much, but at least when the classroom is okay for them, it will be better. So if someone should set up a library for you, you think it would help you? City lab and science lab. We need some monitors, computers. We don't have some. We need the government, the NGOs to help us for our school and our books too. We need some help. Maybe someday life will change and the conditions in this school would improve. But one thing is obvious. Regardless of their current situation, the competitive space of higher education and work will not be kind to these children in spite of their backgrounds. For Joy News, Samuel Kojobreis, Hiawa. And here in Accra, we're taking a quick break. When we return, showbiz is up next. Stay with us. Okay, welcome back. Time for us to do showbiz. Making and nice. I'm here for yeah. showbiz. Mm -hmm. uh, Brace mm -hmm. this evening. Let's talk about poetry because mm. uh, poetry in Ghana has gone through several stages and it has progressed from being scoffed upon to becoming the standard in our culture. Writer and poet Apio called Sarah Mashon Abe revealed the poetry space in Ghana has an immense has seen an immense growth with women playing a larger role. Poetry has mostly evolved into a kind of representation and a means of addressing societal issues through written and spoken words. Ghana's poetry scene is gradually expanding. Writer and poet Apio Kosairam Ashon Agbe asserted that 
more women have been given larger platforms as the poetry community has developed. Huh, it's grown a lot. For one thing, we have more women. Now we have an entire slam dedicated to female poets. That wasn't the case before. And now we're having events like this where we're on Joy News, on different platforms. I work with City Poetry is showing up. It wasn't so before. You have events where the first thing somebody thinks about is let's get a poet to open the you know the, the 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 event it wasn't like that before you only think of a musician at best a cultural troupe but it's changing and i also think that young people are now seeing poetry as a viable craft and a viable business opportunity within the creative art there's still a lot of work to do she also revealed that most Ghanaians mark themselves in order to deal with issues happening in the country you think that Ghanaians wake up every morning and wear a mask um, we keep it pushing. We tend to hide our feelings a lot, our emotions. We're a little more diplomatic about what we're really thinking when somebody offends us and whatnot. But even just dealing with some of the situations in the country, we wear masks and you know we, we, we keep the fire burning regardless of what we're going through. Director of the Writers Project of Ghana, Dr. Martin Egble Wokbe, indicated that the Gwerth Abansho Project is a platform that will help them engage deeply with poets and how best they can contribute to developments. Well, there's more on that particular story mm. uh, in our subsequent bulletins. But let's talk about Ed Sheeran uh, because, well, he mm -hmm. has been found not guilty. Okay. And he spoke exclusively to the press. Take a listen. So for those of you asking, Ed Sheeran did not copy Marvin Gaye's Let's Get It On mm. uh, when composing Thinking Aloud. If you don't know uh, the song Thinking Aloud, uh, Brace, yeah. you know the song. Yeah. You can just sing parts so that we don't get, you know, copyright uh, my, my, issues. My voice anywhere. is not too good, you know. But you can just sing a line of, of, of the song, thinking out loud of Ed Sheeran. Well, now, now, you, now you're okay. thinking. When your legs don't work, don't work like they used to before. When my what? Mm. Mm. Yes, my... <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Okay, there's a song. When your legs don't work like they used to before. Okay. Can we can we and come I back can't to Ghana? Sweep you off your feet. Can we come to Ghana? No, I want to sing this song because I love this song. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. Let's come back to Ghana. Let's let's okay. right, let, let's try yeah. this. This mm -hmm. is throwback Thursday today. Okay. That's it. Uh, let's, uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's you've it. been terrible today with oh, the really? singing. Yeah. I've been why? But I said that. Mm. Uh, okay, you know. Mm. And darling, I mm. will be loving you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. till mm. the 70s. We'll come back tomorrow. Uh, we'll come back tomorrow. And baby, be my heart could still fall as hard as 23. It's not Friday. You can't do karaoke. Oh, please. I'm, I'm <laughs> trying my best. <laughs> All right.